Learning the names of all the major skeletal muscles of the body can be quite a daunting task. There are around 600 different muscles, but the good news is you don't have to learn all of those muscles. There's only a few of them that you're, that you're going to be learning. Now, when you learn these muscles, it's best if you can relate them to function. So learn them in terms of functional anatomy. So it really helps if you can act out the movement of these muscles. That then you're much more likely to actually remember the functions of these muscles. So by acting them, acting these movements out on yourself, this is really going to help you. Another interesting thing, really important, is to relate these attachments to the actions. As you've learned previously, attachments are either origins or insertions. And the origin, recall, is the point of attachment to the less, least, less movable region of the bone. And the insertion is the point of attachment to the more movable part. So you want to read the description, you want to identify it on the figure, and relate the location and the description. This will make your life a lot easier as you're learning these. So this figure is showing many of the main muscles that you have. And what I'll do here is go through and highlight the main ones that you need to know. And notice on Angel, I've already posted a PDF which gives you a list of these major muscles that you need to know. So let's go through a few of them here. These are the anterior muscles. First of all, we see a muscle called the epicraneus. And the epicraneus is the term for um, the frontal belly, the frontalis, combined with the occipitalis. So the, re the belly is a term for the main part of the muscle where all the fascicles can be found. The orbicularis oculi muscle has circular fascicles surrounding the eye. The zygomaticus, you don't need to worry about differentiating between the zygomaticus major and minor. Orbicularis oris, um, you do need to know the platysma, not the sternohyoid. So let me go back through here and erase the sternohyoid. So you do not need to know that one. But you do need to know the platysma. The sternocleidomastoid, this is a good example of a muscle that is named for its points of attachments. In the thorax region, we have the pectoralis minor, the pectoralis major, serratus anterior, and the intercostals. And there'll be a couple different intercostals that you'll need to know, and they're shown in more depth on one of the subsequent slides. We also have in the abdomen, the rectus abdominis, the six pack or eight pack that we can actually form. Um, not very many people can, this is, that, this is not noticeable in very many people. The external oblique, internal oblique, transversus abdominis. In the thigh area, we have the tensor fascia lata. Sounds like a coffee drink. Sartorius, adductor longus, and gracilis. The adductor longus is a great example of a muscle that is actually named for its particular function. So if you go back and look at the last Camtasia lecture, remember one of the reasons that these muscles are named is because of their function. Also recall the direction of the fascicles. So the orbicularis oculi or the orbicularis oris muscle. One of the reasons for the names. In the leg area, we have the gastrocnemius muscle, the soleus muscle, both of which are going to have the same function. On the left-hand side of this figure, we have the temporalis muscle, the masseter muscle, trapezius muscle, deltoid muscle. And so the rest of these you do need to know as well. And again, a lot of them are named for where they're located, their function, like the flexor Carpi radialis. I do not need to know the iliopsoas or the pectineus muscle, but in the thigh you do need to know the quadriceps group. And there are four different muscles that make the quadriceps, but you can't see one of the muscles because it is directly deep to the rectus femoris muscle. Then you do need to know the fibularis longus as well as the tibialis anterior. On the posterior view here, 
we can see the epicranius again. And again, the epicranius is the term for the occipitalis muscle combined with the frontalis muscle. So essentially, the term occipitalis is the same thing as referring to the occipital belly. So if we go back to the previous slide, the frontal belly is essentially the same thing as using the term frontalis. So it's important that you know that those two words mean essentially the same thing. And then we also have on the right side of this diagram, we can see the trapezius. So when one refers to working their traps, they're working their trapezius muscle, the deltoid infraspinatus, teres major muscle, rhomboid major, and latissimus dorsi. And again, on mastering a &P, there are just some fantastic a &P Flix videos which go over many of these muscles. The thigh, we have the adductor magnus, again another example of a muscle named for its specific function. The hamstrings group contains these three muscles, and these are going to be the antagonistic muscles to the quadriceps. In the arm, we have the triceps brachii, brachialis, brachioradialis, extends their carpi radialis longus, again a specific muscle that's named for its function, extends their digitorum, extends their carpi ulnaris, and in the leg we have the gastrocnemius, soleus, fibularis longus, and we have a specialized tendon called the Achilles tendon, also called the calcaneal tendon. So these are more of the superficial muscles. This is not the exha exhaustive list of all the muscles that you need to know, but it's kind of a starting point for some of the major muscles that you need to learn. And when we learn these muscles, it's very important that you know them in groups first, and that'll help, that'll make learning the names of the muscles a little easier. So let's start with the head first. Let's start with the muscles of the head. And the muscles within the head have two major groups to them. First of all, there are muscles that are going to affect the facial expression. And you have lots of tables that are in Chapter 10. You don't need to know all of these different muscles, the ones that are, only the ones that I'm really going to highlight here, and the ones that are already in Angel on that PDF that you have. So let's start with the epicranius muscle. And again, the epicranius muscle is the general term for the combination of the occipital muscle along with the frontal muscle. So it also can be referred to as the occipitofrontalis. It has two different parts to the muscle, which is what this term bipartite is referring to. It has the frontalis, the frontal belly, and the occipital belly, which is going to be connected by a flat tendon called the glia aponeurotica. And the function of these muscles is fairly straightforward if we think about where it's going to be located. And so the frontal belly itself is going to pull the scalp forward. So it raises the elbows, or what well, raises the elbows raises the eyebrows, excuse me. And a lot of times, it's nice in this, in this particular textbook because they have, um, they have highlighted these, le the functions, the actions in blue. For the occipital belly, the occipitalis, it's going to pull the scalp in a posterior direction. So this would be the occipitalis function and the frontalis function would be pulling the scalp forward as for raising our eyebrows. So in this diagram, you can see both of those that are shown here. So we see the frontalis, the frontal belly, and the occipital belly, both of which are making the epicranius muscle up. And then on the very top of the head, we have a tendon. It's just a flattened tendon called an aponeurosis. So you should recognize that an aponeurosis is a type of tendon. So some of the other important muscles are the muscles of mastication. 
So the muscles that are involved specifically with chewing. And there are four pairs of muscles that are involved in mastication. And all are in are controlled by this very important cranial nerve called cranial nerve number five. And it's called the trigeminal nerve. And the nerve supplies are not real important at this point, but this particular nerve is gonna be important later when we get to the nervous system. So the prime movers of jaw closure would first of all be the masseter muscle. And the masseter muscle is going to be one of the prime movers. Another important one is the temporalis, and its function is going to be closing the jaw. So both are going to be very important for this function. But the temporalis is also going to elevate and retract the mandible, maintain its position of the mandible at rest, and protract the mandible. So it is going to have some more functions than the masseter. And one of the reasons for this is the sheer size of the temporalis muscle versus the masseter muscle. Then we have some important muscles that are for grinding. And um, this, these are called the pterygoids, but these are two of the specific ones that you don't have to worry about. So on the test, you're not gonna be responsible for the pterygoids. We do have the buccinator muscle, and the buccinator muscle is gonna be important for compressing the cheek. And as you can see on the slide here, it helps to hold the food between the teeth, so it plays a role in chewing. And it keeps food between the grinding surfaces of the teeth. So the buccinator is an important one to remember. And remember, earlier in the semester, you learned where the buccal cavity is. So there's, a, so there's some vocabulary that you've, you've kind of learned earlier on in the semester. And that's going to help you in learning the names of these particular muscles. So this diagram shows some of these important muscles that are involved with chewing and mastication. We can see the temporalis muscle, which is shown here. It's right on the temporal bone, and you know where the, the temporal bone is now. Its origin is on the temporal fossa. So that would be in the more superior region of the bone. So this would be where the temporal fossa would be. And then the coronoid process is gonna be where the insertion is found in this area here. But the origins and the insertions are not real important to memorize. If you know what the action of the muscle is, you should be able to figure out the general area where you find the origin and the insertion. The temporalis, um, so remember is for closing the jaw. The masseter, its insertion is going to be at um, the angle of the ramus of the mandible. So in this particular area where we find the ramus, the origin is going to be found on the zygomatic arch. And again, it's important to remember that the origin is the point of attachment to the, the immovable bone or the less movable bone whereas the insertion is going to be the point of attachment to the more movable bone. And then the um, other one that is shown on this particular slide, besides the masseter, would be the buccinator, or buccinator, you may hear it referred to as. And then the orbicularis oris is another important muscle that you need to know. So make sure that you watch these a and flicks videos on the temporalis, the masseter, and the buccinator. And they are um, very short videos, so that's kind of nice. They're not too extremely long. So before we move on to the thorax, let's just review a couple of the other important muscles that you need to know for facial expression. So there's the muscles of facial expression that we have. Uh, there, so these would be like the epicraneous muscles, the muscles of mastication and tongue movement. So I'd like you to, I'd like to draw your attention to table 10.1 in your textbook. And let's go through some of these muscles that are in the table. And I'll go through the main, main ones that you really need to 
make sure you focus on. So again, you want to use that list in Angel and also, of course, the ones that are right up here. So our epicranius, you should recognize that that is made up of two different muscles. It's made up of the frontalis and the occipitalis. Uh, you also have another muscle called the corrugator supercilii. Uh, we're going to ignore that one, so you're not responsible for that. You are responsible for the two orbicularis muscles, so the orbicularis oculi, responsible for. This is for closing our eyes. Then we have the zygomaticus. And the zygomaticus, you don't need to worry about differentiating between the major and the minor. But both, both of them are going to be for smiling. So both of them are going to raise the lateral corners of the mouth upward. So for smiling is our zygomaticus muscle. The orbicularis oculi is simply for closing the eye. So that's pretty easy to remember based on its location. You don't need to know the rosorius or the levator labii superioris. So we're going to skip down to the next orbicularis muscle. And this would be the orbicularis oris. And this is our, we can use this for kissing and whistling. But primarily it's for closing the lips. So it closes the lips. Uh, then we have the bucinator muscle. And the bucinator muscle is for compressing the cheek. So it can be used for whistling or sucking. And then we also have the platysma. And the platysma is a large superficial muscle. And what it does is it tenses the skin of the neck. And it helps to depress the mandible. So it pulls the lower lip down, produces a downward sag of the mouth. And some other important muscles that you need to know are the masseter muscle. And as we've already gone through, the masseter is important for jaw closure. Then we have the temporalis, which kind of works alongside the masseter as well. It's also important for jaw closure. So a lot of these muscles we're going to see, a lot of them are going to have the same function and work together. We have then the bucinator, which we've already listed before, which compresses the cheek, so I don't think we need to list the bucinator again. So let's go ahead and move to the next slide here. And on the next slide, we see um, the facial expression muscles again. They're going to insert into the skin, important for nonverbal communication. This is one of the differences between an online class and a face-to-face -face class is if you are my face-to-face -face class some of the facial expressions that you make could help me to understand that you're possibly not getting this point so I could repeat those things in a face-to-face -face class however I can't quite do the same thing in an online class there's a ta um, table 10.3 in your textbook you have a lot of muscles that are associated with the hyoid bone, we're not going to worry about any of those. So there's the omohyoid, sternohyoid, geniohyoid, mylohyoid, digastric. We're going to skip those. So that is the great news. And you can see a lot of those that are shown. You may want to spend extra time looking at these particular muscles. It's excellent bedtime reading, but it's not that important for um, this class. But some other ones that are important to know are the anterior lateral neck muscles. And the big one that you need to know is sometimes it's abbreviated as the SCM. And it actually stands for the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And this is one of the muscles which is a great example of a muscle named for its points of attachments. 
This is a very, this forms the V-shaped, a V-shape that goes from our neck down to our sternum. So it's going to actually attach to the mastoid process, which you've learned about already this semester. It's also going to attach to the sternum and to the clavicle. And it's going to flex and laterally rotate the head. And then you don't have to know the scalenes or the splenius. And so what you want to do in your textbook is you want to go through and you want to really highlight these main muscles that you know that you need to study. And a lot of them you're going to have to learn in your lab as well. So it's nice that they go hand in hand. So let's go through on this slide and highlight some of the important ones that I've mentioned that you need to know. So the orbicularis oculi used for closing the eyes. It's a really good practice that when you name the muscle you also name the function. The zygomaticus minor and major are both important in um, in smiling so it raises the lateral corners of the mouth. Then we have the bucinator or buccinator, whichever one you prefer to say within the buccal cavity. But this is an important one because it's also going to be involved with whistling, compressing the cheek, so it's whistling or sucking, compressing the cheek. And one thing that's important for you to notice is um, the direction of the specific fascicles. And in this case, those fascicles are going to be running perpendicular to the masseter. So I'd like you to notice that they run in this direction, from an anterior to a posterior direction. And if we go to a previous slide where some of these muscles are removed, we can look at the deeper muscles. We can see, again, the fascicles run anterior to posterior, and they're perpendicular to the masseter. And so this helps you kind of understand their function. So the bucinator is going to be for compressing the cheek, whereas the masseter muscle is going to be one of the important muscles that play a role in jaw closure. So back to this slide, we have orbicularis oris muscle, the kissing muscle, but this is involved in closing the mouth. We have the um, platysma muscle. The platysma muscle is responsible for tensing the skin of the neck, but also uh, depressing the mandible. Kind of the silly, funny way I remember this is the platysma muscle helps us to look sad like a platypus. I don't know if platypuses necessarily look sad, but that helps me to remember it. So the sillier memory connections that you can actually make, the more likely that your brain is to be able to retain that knowledge. Then we have the temporalis muscle. The temporalis muscle, as you can see, is this fan-shaped muscle. And it's going to be very important in jaw closure as well. Also elevating and retracting the mandible. We then have the masseter for jaw closure, the sternocleidomastoid, and the trapezius. And again, I, I've mentioned that the sternocleidomastoid muscle The sternocleidomastoid muscle does actually begin at the mastoid process and it runs all the way down to where the sternum would be. And then the trapezius muscle, our traps, is a very large superficial muscle. It's a common muscle that's worked out in the gym. And the trapezius muscle is going to be very important specifically for moving our upper back.
So the trapezius muscle is going to be important for stabilizing, raising, and also retracting and rotating the scapula. So there's a lot of movements that we use our trapezius muscle for. So shortening the shoulders, for example, extending the um, head with the scapula fixed in place, and also um, depressing the scapula is what the trapezius would be used for. So now after the facial muscles, we now move to the muscles of the thorax. And some of these important muscles that you'll need to be aware of here, they're all used for the muscles of respiration. And you'll be learning more about them next semester when you get to anatomy and physiology too. But the muscles for breathing, the main muscle that we use for breathing is called the diaphragm muscle. And the diaphragm muscle is going to be dividing the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. So it separates them. And this is a very interesting muscle. It's a dome-shaped muscle. And what's going to happen when we inhale, this dome-shaped muscle is going to move in an inferior direction. And as it moves in an inferior direction, what's going to happen is that the thoracic cage will get larger. So it will actually increase the volume of the thoracic cage. So what it does is it flattens on contraction. So when the diaphragm flattens, it increases the size of the thoracic cage. So this is really the prime mover of inspiration. The other two important muscles of inspiration would be the external intercostals and the internal intercostals. And they're named intercostals because they're actually going to be attached to the costal cartilage, which remember is what actually makes up the rib cage. And they're called external intercostals because they are located more superficially. And the internal costal, in, internal intercostals are going to be much deeper. And you need to remember that the external intercostals are going to be for breathing in. So they actually are going to work along with the diaphragm for inspiration, for breathing in. Whereas the internal intercostals are going to be for forced expiration when we are breathing out. And so the external intercostals are going to pull the ribs toward one another to elevate the rib cage. So again, it's going to increase the size of the thoracic cage. And the internal intercostals are going to be for breathing out, for exhalation. Another important point to, to recognize is that the diaphragm is actually going to be innervated by the phrenic nerve. And as you're going to learn when we get to the spinal cord that the phrenic nerve actually exits the cervical spine. Whereas notice the internal and external intercostals are going to be innervated by the intercostal nerves themselves. So this slide is showing the external intercostals and notice that the fibers are superficial and for the internal intercostals the fibers are deeper. The other interesting thing to note is that the directions of the fascicles are going to move in a completely different direction. So the external intercostals, the fibers, actually move from posterior to anterior, but the internal intercostals are going to be directly deep to the external intercostals, and they actually move from anterior to posterior, the opposite of the external intercostals, which move posterior to anterior. We also can see that the internal intercostals are going to be located closer to the sternal area. 
in this region. And you can see that for the external intercostals, they are going to be located more posteriorly. So in the anterior region, towards the sternum, the external intercostals would be absent in this particular area. So make sure that you watch the ANP flicks on external intercostals as well as internal intercostals. So anything that's on these A&P flicks is fair game for your exam. And so now what we're looking at here is a figure that is looking at the diaphragm from the view of the abdominal cavity. So we're looking up at the diaphragm. And the, again, the diaphragm here is going to be a dome-shaped muscle and it's going to flatten when it is contracted. So it's dome shaped and there's only one P in shaped. So it is dome shaped and it will flatten. So imagine that this area right here is our thoracic cage. Normally when the we're not in breathing in, this would be our diaphragm. But when we do contract, what's going to happen is that the diaphragm flattens and it moves in a more inferior direction. So this increases the volume of the thoracic cage. So our next slide is showing some of the muscles of the abdominal wall. And we can see them shown on this particular slide. We have the rectus abdominis. This is the one that can look like a six pack on some people. We also have the transversus abdominis, the internal oblique, and the external oblique. So first of all, just like the external and internal intercostals, these muscles are also named by which is more superficial and which would be deeper. So as you can guess, the external obliques would be more superficial and the internal obliques would be deeper. And you can see the directions of the fascicles are in opposite directions. The transversus abdominis is going to be perpendicular to the rectus abdominis. The word rectus means that the direction of the fascicles run in a straight line. So let's go over the functions of these particular muscles. Again, you want to make sure you watch the ANP Flix videos for these. So the rectus abdominis muscle, first of all, this muscle is going to be very important to in order to flex and rotate the lumbar region of the vertebral column. We use it to fix and depress our ribs. It helps to stabilize our pelvis during walking. And we use it in sit-ups as well as curls. The external oblique muscles, the ones that are going to be more superficial, are going to be for important for flexing the vertebral column and also compressing the abs. So in, in compressing the abdominal wall. Also important in rotating the trunk and flexion laterally too. So flexing laterally is something that would be different between the external obliques and the rectus abdominis. This kind of makes sense based on where they're located. The internal obliques are going to work along with the, the um, external obliques, so they're going to have similar functions, flexing the vertebral column and compressing the abdomen. So again, when you're learning these, try to learn them in groups. So here we have two muscles that are going to perform the same functions. And then we have the transversus abdominis, which is going to be important for compressing the abdominal contents.
And again, notice the fascicles are going to run perpendicular to the rectus abdominis. So these fascicles are going to run at angles to one another. This provides for additional strength. So we have multiple layers of protection and multiple layers of strength. They're also innervated by the same nerves that are going to control the internal and external um, intercostals. And the main functions would be lateral flexion, especially for the external obliques and internal obliques, rotation of the trunk. And we also use these muscles if we're trying, for example, to um, keep from tightening our bladder to hold our bladder in. Uh, this would be for um, for promoting urination. So the opposite of this, um, defecation, if we're going to try to force a bowel movement, these would be aided by some of these abdominal muscles. Childbirth, so when the expectant mother is told to push, she is using her abdominal muscles. Um, vomiting, coughing, screaming, you all have experienced this before when you've vomited, unfortunately, and then you, so you've been sick and afterwards, you, um, you know that a lot of your abs are sore. So you know that those are the particular muscles that are used for things like vomiting or extreme, extreme coughing. So this slide is one you have in your textbook, and it's showing the external obliques, the more superficial ones. The rectus abdominis is the most medial internal obliques and then the transverse abdominis. So these are the main um, the main abdominal muscles that you need to know. And again, make sure that you watch the A and P flicks on external obliques, internal obliques, rectus abdominis, and transverse abdominis.